What is up, you amazing listeners and viewers tuning in from whichever platform you like to get your podcast from. I'm your host, Chronic, from the Cannabis Chronicles on Instagram and YouTube and all other major streaming platforms. In uh, today's episode of the Cannabis Chronicles brought to us by Visionary Hydroponics and TMB Naturals, I'm going to be teaching all of you about mycology. That's right. This is going to be a mycology 101 type course that's going to be the span of several episodes or um, quite a bit of episodes depending on how in-depth we go. And in this series, I'm going to be doing popcorn tech. So be sure to smash that like button, comment down below, or subscribe or follow along from whichever platform you're tuning in from to show the sponsors some major love. All right, now without further ado, if you guys and gals are watching along, you are going to see me peeking at my phone. Um, I do have a magical uh, mycology with the Cannabis Chronicles on my blog. If you do want to go to the CannabisChronicles.net and check out the blog article, a very in-depth article I wrote. Um, but this is essentially the reason I'm going to be peeking over is because there is a lot to do with supplies. I want to make sure I nail every supplies and um, I want to make sure I nail some of the information that I've already written. That is a little more critical for me. I, I want to, I don't want to miss it all. So to begin this episode, let's start off talking about mycology and mycology 101. Why is it important in all this fun stuff? Um, well, for one, fungus and fungi, uh, whatever we're talking about here, but we're, you know, I, I guess the proper term would be fungi. We're talking about a plural amount, I believe. Um, I'm not Paul Stamets. So Paul Stamets, or St I believe that's how you say his name. Uh, forgive me, Paul, if that is not how you say your last name. Uh, he is an amazing uh, gentleman that is absolutely phenomenally uh, just educated on mushrooms, mycology, mycelium, just everything to do with uh, that type of world, as well as just other botanical stuff in, in general. He's gone on Joe Rogan. He has his own Instagram where he does a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but he is like the man behind mushroom masterminds. So I am not a Paul Stamets. I am a chronic and <laughs> I'm going to talk to you uh, all about my experiences, the knowledge that I know. Um, I'm not qualified enough to go identify mushrooms out in the wild yet. I do have a mushroom book to do that. And uh, I am working my way up to go forage and things like that. But as far as at home fungus for yourself, whether it be um, uh, culinary or psilocybin, I'm very well versed. Now, this whole mycology 101 is supposed to help you learn the basic and fundamental knowledge and principles to grow any type of mushroom. However, there are different variables for every type of mushroom. Like oyster mushrooms do like to have kind of like if you have a bag of substrate to inoculate or like to colonize the substrate in the bag and then make like an X slit on the outside of the bag um, on both sides. And they like to grow outside of things like that because they do that in nature, you know, off the sides of trees and bark. So sometimes you do have to mimic the various circumstances circumstances as far as environmental variables that these fungus come from. However, today and from here on out, we are going to be talking about psilocybin mushrooms or the magical mushrooms or the uh, medicinal kind. So the reason I say medicinal now, there are multiple medicinal kinds. So technically, shiitake mushrooms are medicinal and those are culinary. But shiitake mushrooms have um, helpful, beneficial uh, like uh enzymes i think is what is in the i actually don't know what is in the fungus that causes the it, it, there's benefits to it for your brain helps heal brain receptors and all sorts of things but it's not as it's not as potent and powerful and healing as psilocybin so psilocybin has been shown to actually heal um brain receptors in dementia patients and alzheimer's patients so it's it's shown very great um response to that in the various trials out there that are available um now with Colorado actually doing studies, it's it's going to get drastically more effective. We're going to see a lot more studies on psilocybin. Um, from my personal experience and from also multiple studies that you can look up, um, but I, I will tell attest to this, uh, if you have color blindness or you have any sort of color clarity issues, uh, the cool thing about psilocybin is it does open up your retinas at a specific amount. You'll be able to see colors more clearly. Um, you also have an enhanced taste. So your taste and your sense of smell and touch will all be increased. So all your senses are pretty much heightened. Um, and one of the craziest things is that certain sense at certain doses of psilocybin, you can actually smell pheromones. Um, I don't know how documented that is, but I've talked to multiple people who have done mushrooms and that's a normal side effect for most people is being able to smell other people's true uh, 
pheromones. <laughs> it's a little weird, and that's why generally most people don't do mushrooms around uh, in large doses, large doses around other people that they're not they're not really comfortable with. Um, microdosing is different. You don't really get those effects. You get the uh, clear mind, the creativity. Um, you may even get some color clarity. You might get some taste or some touch. But with 0.25 or less doses, you're not going to get like crazy amounts of effects. You're just going to get all the medical benefits, which is like healing of brain receptors. Um, so for any TBI issues, you have, you know, all that anti-anxiety, um, just a little more. Um, there's there's just dozens and dozens of benefits. So if you're watching this, you probably already know that there's many benefits to it and you just want to learn how to grow. So what's the first and foremost thing that we we go over? What's the fundamentals of? fungus it is cross-contamination okay that is uh, a lot of people think they're clean and so i come from a tattoo artist background i do have to and and i'm not just like any jank tattoo artist that is not does not care about their space does not care about crossing contamination and i'm not somebody who doesn't understand what that means so i take it very seriously bloodborne pathogens are very serious in my job um i don't want to bring anything home and i don't want to catch anything it's just you know it's working in um, sterile environments and sanitary environments require certain procedures and there's a massive difference between sterile and sanitary and when we're working with fungus ideally we are working in a sterile environment practically 99 percent of people who are watching this and listening do not have a lab at home and or a clean room at home or a flow hood or like some of the things that would require to make it more of a sterilized or sanitary environment so we're aiming towards sanitary Sanitary is cleaning 99.9% .9 of the germs off the surface and ridding most of the bacteria, but you're not killing things like a tubercul tuberculosis spore, or maybe you're not killing something like an HIV spore. So bloodborne pathogens, we're not really having to be concerned with. It's mainly the mold and mildew. So luckily for us, 70% 70 70 isopurple alcohol, as well as household bleach, does the job for all of that. So um as far as cleaners those are the two cleaners that i recommend now bleach is for your surface cleaning any countertop that you're going to work with i recommend working on granite countertops or non-porous countertops i know granite is porous but generally it's sealed and it's able to be wiped down and cleaned so um granite countertops are usually really nice to be working on um, otherwise getting a large mat that you can actually work in is great so one thing that i'm actually going to be teaching during this entire um mycology um episodes and all this fun stuff is a sterile air bin so this is a makeshift laboratory at home it's actually just get it all it consists of is getting a massive clear uh stair light tote or some sort of like plastic tote it's a big bin you want a really big bin trust me you want to be able to work in it and put stuff down um not like a massive bin but like a you know 55 quart or something like or i think 55 gallon or whatever that is um a big bin you want a big bin and so um i have some options that i'll, I'll talk to you guys and gals about here but you do want a big bin and for this sterilized air bin sterilized uh uh air bin i don't know why that i have no idea why that escaped my mind there it's called a sab so sab that is kind of the nickname that you'll you'll find in various articles or or if you're looking it up online and you're trying to get um you know, you're trying to watch some YouTube videos or whatever it may be. So I have a 30 gallon storage tote as my sab. So that's what I'm using. Um, all it is, is a literal storage tote flipped upside down so that the lid is the base. And essentially what you'll do is you'll create two holes that you can put your hands through. If you want to make it like even more sterilized, what you do is you would actually put, um, you would like fasten gloves, um, the garden type gloves, you know, the, the ru rubber thick gloves that you can spray down um, for gardening. Well, you would fasten those with like glue, hot glue, um, however you go about doing it, tape, whatever it may be. Hot glue is probably the best. Um, and you would make like almost like what you would see in the movies where the lab scientists are working with like toxin toxins and like diseases and stuff where there's like a box where they stick their hands into gloves and it's all concealed in that. That's what we're going for is just a sterile air bin. Um, the biggest part of contamination when it comes to, uh, mycelium and mycology is actually not necessarily, I don't want to say the biggest, one of the biggest contribu contributing factors is just people's breath blowing across the mycelium, um, airflow from a vent 
or just uh, a fan or something like that just airflow so uh you don't want unclean air you, you don't want like dirty air so dirty air actually has particles dust and or dirt mildew spores all sorts of things in it depending on where it's at and you don't want necessarily bad air coming across in contact with your mycelium so when working with all of your stuff to inoculate to put your substrate in to you know or put your grains into your substrate to do all that kind of stuff you want to having a sterile air bin makes working in your apartment or maybe if you have a, a not necessarily clean area to work in it puts all that clean space into a minimized space that you can work in and spray down every time so we're going to be talking about that a little bit through this and bear with me because mycology is a lot but a lot of it is just going over being clean being cognizant of what you touch where you touch um you know which like surfaces you're touching because if you touch one surface that isn't clean and then touch another surface that is clean now that clean surface is no longer clean so we're going to be talking about all sorts of cross contamination and all that fun stuff but to get into a supply list basically um this is going to include the sterile air bin sterile air bin and everything you need for popcorn tech at home meaning to sterilize your own grains uh to make your own jars that you can inoculate and to basically rinse and repeat the process and you never have to uh, buy sterilized grain or you never have to uh, worry about grain again um, you'll just have to worry about substrate so to start off the list we you want various size storage totes because we're going to be making monotubs i find monotubs are the easiest beginner friendly way to go about cultivating mushrooms i have a 30 gallon storage tote for my sterile air bin um, a seven quart storage uh, container and a 15 quart storage container. I also have a couple different sizes. You basically, you want some tall Sterilite bins and then you want some shorter ones because some mushrooms don't grow as tall. Like for instance, uh, Albino Penis Envy and a few other ones grow very stout and short. So you don't need a very tall container. However, like Mazotapics or the UFOs that I'm cultivating currently, those supposedly grow very tall. My Mazatapex grew very tall. So you want a container that has the height so that um, the stems can grow the, uh, out and then the fruiting bodies can open and they can get nice and thick and all that fun stuff. Now, mind you, everything that I'm about to tell you is actually under $100. So um, part of my thing is uh, Homegrown Fungi, a magical adventure just for $100. So I actually did manage to do this all for $100 or just about at the $100, $120 mark. Um, if you were to go balls to the wall and buy like everything and anything. Um, so a hot glue gun or silicone caulk, caulk, hot glue gun or silicone, silicone caulk. Sorry, uh, that's, it sounds, I have a, I have, I have a stutter and I can't say that L in the word, no matter what. Um, I have a caulk gun. And so it's just cheaper for me to do that. But I also have a hot glue gun and I have hot glue on hand. So I have either or. So most households have those, but you want one or the other. You want a soldering iron or a hot knife. You'll want a box of medical gloves. You can either use nitro, latex, or vinyl. I find nitrile are the best, in my opinion. 70% isopropyl alcohol. That's super cheap at Walmart. Bleach or a medical grade cleaner like Cavicide. So you'll want something like bleach, like I said, or Cavicide, which is a human safe, household safe, kind of like a medical grade cleaner. It's what they use in um, hospitals and stuff. You'll want hand sanitizer or alcohol or if you're, like basically you'll want to spray your hands with alcohol or spray your gloves with alcohol. Um, you'll need trimming shears to cut the fruiting bodies once they're done. I don't like to pinch them off because I don't like to uh, uh, like sometimes I'll rip other things off. I don't want if there's more fruiting bodies next to them. So I just I cut exact. Um, You'll need dry hangers or a dehydrator to basically dry your mushrooms. I also use a baking sheet with just a baking rack onto it. So they're lifted and I stick those racks into my dry tent and that's generally how I dry them. So you can also do that method as well. Um, you'll need polyfill, which is at Walmart. That's the stuff that goes into teddy bears and things like that. So very, very cheap. Uh, you'll need a large clear storage tote. Like I said, uh, oh, I used a 66 quart latch box. That's apparently what I use. So, um, that's the one that I use for that one. Um, like I said, you'll need garden gloves or rubber cleaning gloves. You'll need a four to six inch PVC couplings. I put two there. That's what I attach my gloves with to my sterile air bin. Um, you'll want a lighter. 
That is actually going to be our flame, flame sterilization method for when you repeat your inoculation process with spore syringes or even if you get a clean syringe, it's just a good habit to flame, steri flame sterilize the tip just to double check or double like ensure yourself. You'll need popcorn or sterilized green. You can get a green spawn bag for $8, but if you go to uh, Walmart, you can get popcorn for $2 and that popcorn will fill a bunch of green jars. So really it's just labor and time. It usually takes about eight hours, a, it, roughly four to eight hours to do the entire popcorn process of sterilizing grains but you usually get anywhere from like six to eight big jars or like a bunch of little jars. So pretty decent amount of, uh, depending on how much you do. And then you can add coffee grounds to it, um, just like regular coffee grounds. And you can actually make sure that your grains have proper nutrients. So we'll get into that. Um, you'll need a pressure cooker, minimum eight to 12 PSI. You can get a very inexpensive one at Walmart. Um, you can actually get one for $30. That's what I did. You'll need mason jars. You want wide mouth. They're like 12 bucks, but regular mouth do work as well, but they're $9. It's just more annoying. Um, lids for mason jars. You're actually going to need the inoculation lids, and those are $3 each. It doesn't matter which one you get. You'll also need a stock pot, which you can get a stock pot for $25. Most households have one, but I just bought one at Walmart for 25 bucks. And then you can get a 5 watt or 10 watt T5 fluorescent or LED bulb if you want to grow your mushrooms with light. I, you don't have to, you can actually grow them in complete darkness and they fruit and do everything perfectly fine. Or if you have like ambient lighting in the room or something like that, where you can just like, once they're ready to fruit, you can let the ambient lighting just kind of like go over top the lid. They don't need much lighting because they usually grow on the forest floors and things like that. So they just need a little bit or none at all. Um, you'll want black duct tape or gorilla tape. Or you'll just need duct tape that you have enough of to layer multiple times. So that is like it blocks the light. Um, distilled water or purified water. You'll need a medical grade face mask for nose or mouth. Because once you start working with the um, fruiting bodies, you don't really want the spores. You don't want to inhale the spores and stuff like that. It's It can be dangerous to your lungs. It's fungus spores. So just keep that in mind. Um, sterilized substrate. You can get sterilized substrate for about $9. I use a cocoa substrate and that's for about two pounds. So I think it's like 18 bucks or 20 bucks for five pounds or something like that. So not bad. Okay. So now as far as the sterile air bin and all that fun stuff, we're I already kind of explained what that was. It's just a makeshift little lavatory. I'll show it on screen real quick because it's on my phone. Um, that way those watching can kind of get a visual. So sorry for the little light ring there. But that is a sterile air bin. Um, yeah, you guys can see it now. It's essentially just something that you put your stuff in to work in. There's the two little glove imprints. But it's just a little, it's a flipped over sterilite bin with two holes that have gloves in that you can spray everything down and clean the inside of it and stick all your stuff in for inoculation and all that. Now, how to even get started. You've got all your supp supplies. What are the next thing you need? You actually need uh, spore syringes. So that's your... That's pretty much the last thing you'll need to acquire. I recommend Fungus Head. Um, they're a really great website. They have a good quality uh, supply of mushrooms. There's a lot of different mycology breeders out there who sell spore syringes and all that fun stuff. So you can find it. Um, there's people who even sometimes trade in liquid culture syringes, which is not a legal thing to do, but <laughs> you know. Go talk to your friends and things like that. That's that's all I'll say about that. Um, but I only I only usually get spore syringes because that's actually legal in all states except for like I think three or something like that. It's like California, Alabama, and I don't remember which states it's it's not legal in. But um, you can look it up on Google. I believe it's Alabama, California, and Hawaii or something like that. So where I get all the rest of the supplies is foxfungi.com. That's a that's a really great uh, mushroom. They have liquid culture for culinary uh, spores or culinary uh, strains, which you can do. You just can't do liquid culture of uh, psilocybin strains because a spore syringe is kind of like cannabis seeds where it's considered a novelty item or for mycoscopy research until you inoculate it. When those spores are inoculated, then it's like germinating a seed. Then it becomes the plant or in this case, it becomes mycelium. And in a liquid culture, it is already in a, a um, inoculated uh, state so it's already producing mycelium in a culture so yeah you there's a difference there so um that's that and essentially 
the uh really the only things you just need after that point is time because you're gonna have to work on sterilizing your grains and the the, the process of sterilizing your grains um really isn't that hard let me uh get down to here where we huh. now i have this by a step-by-step -step process but this is a very long process so bear with me i'm going to explain this on sterilizing your grains at home this is the first step now if Again, you don't have to do this labor. You can just buy grains. And then the process is simply just putting your grains inside your sterilized air bin where you've wiped down with bleach. You've allowed it to air air dry. And then prior to putting anything in, I usually go ahead and take my spray bottle with uh, isopropyl alcohol and spray the inside of the uh, container. And then I set, I spray my jars, wipe down my jars completely with is isopropyl alcohol, the grain jars or the grain bags. And I set them in the sterile air bin. Then I do the same thing with every single product. I the, the syringes, the lighter, anything that I'm going to be using inside the bin, I go ahead and do that. Just remember though, if you spray alcohol inside the bin and you have to use a lighter, you're going to need to air out the bin or allow the alcohol to dissipate so you don't create like a fire hazard inside the bin because alcohol is flammable. So um, to sterilize your grains, we're going to go ahead and first light up your stove and you let it burn... Um, not too high you want it low um i don't really have like a, a temperature it's just simmering that's essentially what you want to do you're going to add uh two tablespoons of ground coffee per 32 ounces 32 ounce bag of popcorn so if, for every 32 ounces of popcorn that you're using you're just going to do add two tablespoons of ground coffee um you drop the grains inside the pot um you cover them with water and then you pretty much allow a two inch margin right above the grains and you boil that so as the it will simmer as it simmers you set your timer for an hour once the it simmers for an hour um you make sure to stir occasionally every like 10 minutes or so because you don't want them to burn and then you get them up to boiling okay once they're boiling you're going to prepare your workspace which you need to clean everything down with 70 percent isopropyl alcohol like i already said um, once that hour is up, you go ahead and drain the grains in a, um, colander or whatever those are called. And you want to make sure I wipe the colander down after cleaning it. Um, like I'll, I'll clean it with like dish soap and things like that. Wipe it down with, uh, uh, paper towels and then wipe it down with alcohol Then let that air dry. And then I'll put the grains in there. Uh, and I put the colander on a drying rack for an hour, shaking it, uh, just every so often. Usually, sometimes it takes like three hours. These things can be really, really hot, but you'll have to put on your um, your gloves, your, the nitrile gloves or whichever kind of gloves you're using, latex, vinyl, whatever it is, and you're going to wipe down every single jar that you're going to be filling with 70% isopropyl alcohol. And even prior to this, I would go ahead and wash every jar very thoroughly, including the lids. And by lids, I don't mean just normal lids. You're going to want to get inoc you're going to want to get the mycology converted lids which Fox Fungi does have lids on their website for super cheap for the jars. So you can just get their lids. It already has the um it has a very nice filter on it and it has the uh uh self-healing injection site which is all you pretty much need. So um you want to make sure to clean every jar in and out thoroughly and the lids with 70% isopropyl alcohol and set that on a tray or a clean surface or inside the sterile air bin. Now, once the grains are cool, um, you'll want to take a metal spoon that you've cleaned with alcohol. Again, clean every tool that you're using and make sure that you're anytime you go to clean your tools, you're putting on new gloves and you're you're not cross contaminating from dirty surfaces. If you've touched anything outside of like basically the, the process should be if you are working with your mushrooms, you wash your hands, you dry them with paper towels then you put on gloves and then you spray your gloves down with alcohol. And then those things should, every time you touch a dirty surface, you exchange the gloves. And if your hands touch a dirty surface, you need to re-clean your hand and repeat the process. It's it's very annoying and sometimes can dry your skin out. It can be frustrating. But this is how you do not get bacteria within anything that you're working with at home, especially when it comes to growing fungus. We're growing bacteria or we're growing a fungus. You know what I'm saying? So um, you're going to fill each jar until there's about an inch and a half to two inches of space left at the top. You don't want... Um, you just want about an inch and a half gap. And then <clears throat> you'll use a uh, pasta uh, pot or a large colander or your pressure cooker to basically sterilize these jars. So what you're going to do is you're going to put your you're going to put your lids on. You're going to take some aluminum foil. You're going to take a little small sheets, cover the lids so that the humidity and water 
don't fall into the, the filter and mess up your stuff. And you're going to stick your, uh, your mason jars full of your grains inside of a stock pot that's on a double boiler or which my stock pot has an insert. So I just use my stock pot and that's lifted off the base. And then you're going to fill that stock pot full of water up to like the necks or like, you know, like not over overflowing the jars, but a good enough water to last. Um, I think we're gonna go about two hours to three hours. Uh, generally on, the, if you have a pressure cooker, it's just until it gets to 12 to 15, I think it's 12 to 15 PSI. I have to look up the specific PSI, but I believe it's 12 PSI. Um, and it's, it has to be at 12 PSI for two hours, I believe is what, it, um, um, it's supposed to be. So, um, yeah, two hours. So sorry, I had a double check time here. So yeah, when the two hours pass, you essentially just let them, uh, let everything cool down for six hours. If you're using a pressure cooker, you need to let it cool down and you have to let the little pressure gauge, you know, psh you have to let all that pressure just go out before you even mess with that pressure cooker and you want to let everything uh chill out pressure cookers can be like bombs on your stove so seriously don't don't overdo it um don't go crazy with it uh you if you're using the pressure cooker from walmart the little thimble thing that's the weight is the eight i believe it's an eight psi or 12 psi pressure cooker i think it's an eight psi pressure cooker but essentially that has to lift back up and down and kind of dance on the pressure cooker to be at 8 psi if you're using a lower pressure cooker versus like if you're not using a stock pot and you're or if you're using i'm sorry i'm gonna say this again if you're not using a pressure cooker that's at a specific psi i believe 15 um or 12. hold on let me just google that really quick but anyways if you're not using one of the higher pressure cookers essentially if you're using the walmart pressure cooker i'm using you're gonna have to go for about three hours to four hours to ensure that you're actually sterilizing your grains because you're not at the pressure that actually is considered sterilizing. So here, let me look that up. 15 PSI. So I was right. So 15 PSI at two hours is perfect. But if you're not at 15 PSI for two hours, uh, I do eight PSI for four hours uh, to six hours. So you need to be checking the uh, pressure cooker water during that time. And um, exchange it like that's generally why i like my stock pot is because i can just do my stock pot and do my stock pot extra long and i can just add more water to it with a pressure cooker you really can't stop because you're gonna have to stop stop the whole thing it can be very dangerous to stop so i generally don't like that um that's just personally uh yeah it's just personally my my way about doing things i i don't like doing that so once that's good, um, you're going to let that come to uh, a chill for six hours and then you're good. You can remove it and you can wipe everything down with alcohol on the outside and voila, your grains have literally been sterilized. You can remove all the aluminum sheets and you have sterilized grains and that's your grains for, um, you know, inoculation. The next part of it is inoculation. Inoculation is essentially taking your sterilized uh your, your your spore syringe um and you're going to set your grain jars that you've now created inside of your sterilized air bin make sure wipe down everything wipe down the everything like i talked about every surface the syringe literally every crevice everything wipe down everything thoroughly with isopropyl 70 percent and then once you do that, you're going to flame sterilize the tip of the syringe. Do not poke yourself with the syringe. I'm not joking. These, this is fungus spores. You do not want to poke yourself with fungus spores. So uncap the syringe very carefully. Light the end of the tip until it's red glowing hot. Let it cool down for about one to two seconds. Then insert it into the self-healing injection port. Once it's inserted, do not directly start shooting spores into it let the tip cool down for about three to five more seconds because now that you've inserted it you're in a sterile environment inside you've got the tip inside everything's good to go you can go ahead and wait for that tip to not be crazy hot to kill your mycelium or your spores um, and then when you go to do it you'll go ahead and shoot about one to five milliliters or cc's whatever you want to call it it's milliliters on most spore syringes into each jar i usually do one milliliter one milliliter is perfect um if you go crazy it's just a waste because it really one milliliter to five milliliters will do more than enough for inoculating grain jars you only need a little bit of mycelium colony to go ahead and create clumps and in multiple places to create their colony start eating the grain and then connect eventually and become one full little inoculated inoculated grain jar that after seven seven days you could potentially bump shake 
or after 14 days if you're fully inoculated you can go ahead and put into your substrate now once you've let out the uh inoculate once you've inoculated a jar and you pulled the syringe out if you're going to inoculate another jar um with the same thing as long as you're in the sterile air bin and you haven't touched the syringe or haven't touched anything else and you haven't allowed any exchange of cross-contamination you can continue inoculating your um jars without having to flame sterilize in between if you're removing or changing or doing anything in between or using a new syringe or anything like that that's a new that you haven't flame sterilized previously i it's a good practice to to st flame sterilize in between it's technically a good practice to flame sterilize in between but i say don't do it because there's generally spores in the syringe that you know you're gonna end up killing so i usually don't do it do that um i go ahead and do my flame sterilization prior to all my jars you know i'm inoculating so that i can just quickly inoculate them back to back boom 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 put the cap back on the uh, the uh syringe so i don't stab myself or stab anything and then i wipe everything down and then if i have another strain to do i do that strain after so it's just a, a this is basically a patience is a virtue process because once your grains are sterilized then it's a matter of fact of not breathing all up on your grain jars and storing your grain jars in a proper place i use a black 55 gallon well i think that was the original 30 gallon uh a black 30 gallon um uh bin that's completely black that has like a, a lid on top and you want i use that as my sterile space for storing any monotubs or grain jars it has a good bit of height and it can store multiple bins. So it has a good bit of height and it can store multiple bins. And I really enjoy um, it looking discreet. So that's a big one. It just looks like a bin in my closet or a bin wherever I'm. I could literally put it in my living room and no one would know if I had like a, a storage shelf of shit, right? So the best thing about this too is you can wipe down the entire bin. If you need to create a small, a, a, a slightly humid environment, you can just spray some distilled water into the bin and create a humid environment for your bin instead of individually inside your monotubs if you don't want to over spray your monotubs. That's the nice thing. You just want to make sure that you clean any standing water, you fan the bin. What that means is, is daily, twice daily, morning and night, you go in and you lift the lid with, and you do not want to be breathing across. That's why you want to be wearing your mask. And you go ahead and fan air into your bin. You want to fan clean air too. So uh, generally you don't want your mycelium to be in a space that's dirty, like a basement that you don't, you know, that's not renovated, an attic, nothing like that, or under your bed, nothing like that. You want them in a very, you want them in a clean space. Um, you'll probably need to check on your grain jars once every two to three days. And what I mean by that is I like to check on just how they're going. Um, you technically don't even need to check on them for 14 days. Really, Realistically, you can inoculate and not check on them for 14 days. And you'd be perfectly fine. Um, as long as they have air exchange wh wherever they're at, That like the, if that bin's not fully sealed and you allow air to go in and you've cracked it or something like that, then they'll be perfectly fine. Um, whenever you go and exchange stuff, wear your mask and use alcohol to always spray the grain containers and always wear gloves anytime you touch the containers and anytime you touch your bin. You should always spray the outside of the bin before touching it. And you should always spray the inside of the bin just a little bit when fanning air into the bin. Because I like the principle if I spray enough alcohol into the air, the air going through that alcohol mist is going to come in contact with those particles and essentially clean the air somewhat, scrub it somewhat of some particles. It's a safety precaution that I go through that I just do every time. And it's worked well for me. So that's what I like to do. So, and then I, and anytime I lift the grain jars, I've already pre-sprayed my uh, alcohol. I've already alcohol sprayed my gloves. And then I touch the grain jar with the glove I've sprayed. And then I usually spray off the grain jar after I'm done. And I set it back into the container. I don't go about wiping off the residual alcohol. It will air dry and dissipate. Um, I leave it on there just to kill anything that may, I may have brought in just checking. So that's a big thing. Checking your stuff is generally when cross-contamination happens. So don't get so antsy to check your bins constantly. You only need to check your bins once you inoculate and even when you put your um your inoculated grain spawn into your substrate you only need to be checking your bins like every 24 to 48 hours realistically um there's not a lot of drastic changes that happen and you really only need to spray them or fan them every 24 hours usually i i do that just once a day i just go and check them real quick fan them give them some air exchange and then we're good 
Um, the way I have my mono tubs, uh, they have enough air exchange just in general in a 24 hour period with the uh, polyfill and everything like that. But I like to fan the tub and I like to fan the actual bin that they sit in. Um, so it just helps give better air exchange, fresher air and everything like that. But essentially what, what we're doing from this process is we're allowing our mycelium to colonize on the grain spawn that we've created. And it's going to take about 14 to 21 days, give or take the strain. Most of the time it's 14 days for me, um, like blue meanies or albino penis envies or mazotopics or anything like that. Um, after that, what you'll need to do is you'll need to break out the sterile air bed and again, clean everything down. Like we talked about, you'll need to get substrate. Like I talked about the cocoa substrate preferred. If it comes in a pre-sterilized bag, like it normally does, you'll need to spray down the entire bag crevices and all, and you'll want to wipe it down with alcohol. And you'll want to do it a couple times just to make sure you truly clean that bag. You'll want a pair of scissors that you can spray down fully and clean with isopropyl alcohol. And then you'll go ahead and cut the bag open. If you're growing in the bag, this is where you'll pour your grains all into the bag and you'll essentially mix them up with clean gloves. Um, how you do this is you spray your gloves with isopropyl alcohol, and then you take and you let them air dry for about 30 seconds. Then you wipe the, wipe the residual moisture off with paper towels. Paper towels that are clean, okay? That is important. Not like sitting out randomly, people touch and all that other stuff. No, clean roll of paper towels. Um, and then you're going to mix your hands into the soil with the grains. You don't want to, you do not want to have alcohol come in contact with mycelium. It will kill the mycelium. So you're just trying to clean the surface of your gloves before coming in contact with the mycelium. So you're going to mix your grains through your bag if you're growing it that way. And then you're going to use like a chip clip that you've cleaned off prior, 70% alcohol again. And you're going to fold your bag over, not to where the filter port is still able to exchange air. Um, but you've now created a crease at the top. Usually I like to do two folds and then I clip the bag. And now you've created a, a, a space for your bag. And prior to clipping it and folding it, I like to have a on hand distilled bottle of distilled water in a spray bottle um, that I've sprayed down with alcohol and all that fun stuff so I can touch it. And I'll spray inside the bag to give it a humid space so that the substrate is like everything's moist. That is great for specific types of mushrooms and various types of growing. If you don't have light that's coming from the sides, because you'll need to make sure that your bags go sit in something like a tray or something that's blocking lights from the sides, because pins will happen from the side and you don't necessarily want that. We want all the pinning to happen at the top. So that's why I like to grow in either complete darkness because then the pins just naturally go to the top or I'll have ambient lighting that goes over the top and I have my black duct tape around the bottom at two inches to three inches of my bins, blocking all the light. So that's what the Gorilla Tape or Black Duct Tape is for, which you could technically tape a bag. So that is an option. Just make sure you spray down your gloves, you wipe down the tape that you're working with, and then you wipe down the bag afterwards once you're done working with it before you put it back into your growth space. So if you're not working with a bag, and if you're not doing that entire process, what you would do is you would cut the bag open, you would pour the bag about a one inch layer, of the substrate into your mono tub and then you would pour a, a, a good layer of your and not uh, your grain spawn then you pour another one to two inch layer then you do another grain spawn layer then another uh, cocoa layer then another grain spawn layer until your substrate and your uh your grain spawn are gone you want to layer it up the reason you do that is you're going to have a way more even colonization through the substrate because it's going to take the mycelium to colonize the entire substrate before pinning happens once you see the first sites of pinning, you can start the fruiting. Um, you can make it a little more humid and the fruiting process will actually start, which will, you'll see fruiting bodies. And then you'll see your monotub actually kind of blossom or your bag blossom full of um, um, pinning mushrooms that will eventually open up and start to uh, tear their veils and open and rip their veils. Most mushrooms you want to get right as the veil is starting to tear and has not fully ripped. That's the prime psilocybin stage for consumption. Um, and drying your mushrooms will always make them a little more potent. I shouldn't say a little, a lot more potent than um, eating wet mushrooms fresh. So um, definitely dry them. But how you want to create a fruiting um, kind of environment is just you just up the humidity a little bit, meaning you'll probably just spray your bin once a day versus once every two to three days like you will whenever we put the initial grains in. So when we put the initial grains in, we'll put our uh, mono tub that has multiple holes 
for airflow and those holes are filled with polyfill which is that filter you make a big ball and stick it in the hole so pest and dander and mildew and all that fun stuff can't get through but air exchange can happen and then we'll put that bin inside of that black tote and we'll set the black tote somewhere and essentially every day we'll check on our bin. We'll make sure to wear a mask and not breathe across. We'll slightly fan the air out. And anytime you work with the bin, you want to make sure to spray the outside of the bin with alcohol and you spray your gloves with alcohol before working with the bin. If you're going to open up the bin and check it, which you shouldn't do, you should really only open your bin maybe every 48 hours roughly. It doesn't need air exchange like that. And you minimize the chances of cross-contamination from air, air issues. Um, you can literally just lift it and fan. I'll have videos on this. I'm actually, um, I have a video on my phone that I'm filming and that I'm working on. That is going to be a complete mycology guide start to finish of how I grow the UFO, um, the UFO strain in popcorn tech. So I'm going to do a whole overview of that, but essentially at this stage, you're, you're just waiting for the mycelium to colonize the substrate and get to a fruiting body. Your job is to make sure that the there is no pooling water. There is no, there's not too much humidity. It's not too dry. Um, so you want roughly about a 65 or, or I think it's about 60 to 65% mark for humidity for mushrooms. Uh, sometimes certain mushroom strains do like it 80% or higher. Um, but you, they do like humid environments. I find the 65% mark to be a really happy place because it's fairly humid, but it's not too humid to where there's not pulling marks. Now, how do you know about that? Well, I'm a grower and I just generally know how, how wet the atmosphere or something is like living in Florida. I know what it feels like. So instead of making, spraying the crap out of my individual bins, what I'll do is I'll give them a nice misting. So the substrate stays wet. And I, I usually just miss the top of the lid once. But I'll miss the container that they're the big black tote they're in. I'll miss the sides and stuff to create like a 75, 80% atmosphere so that inside the bins, they're probably roughly about 65 to 70% humidity, give or take, because the soil and substrate's going to be absorbing some of that moisture. Um, you'll be surprised how much moisture those uh, the mushrooms actually absorb. So, well, the substrate, especially when they're colonizing mycelium. Um, so it's really cool to see the process, but here is just keeping everything clean. Like literally every time you touch anything, just it needs to be previously sprayed with alcohol. You need to make sure that you're not spraying alcohol onto your mycelium. So how you do that is just making sure you clean all the surfaces. All your surfaces are clean before touching. And basically everything before the mycelium touched it has to be clean. So your bins needed to be pre-cleaned and sanitized with, you know, with your bleach or alcohol, like we talked about, and then air dried and then like you know, wipe down again, potentially just to be double sure. So like just making sure you're repeating the processes of being clean is how you'll be successful with fungus. It, if you add a, like I said, a little light that's over top your bin, if you take the lid off and like you just allow light to get to it a couple hours of the day, six to eight hours a day, or even less, you'll have some nice fruiting bodies. However, even if you have no light, you're going to have nice fruiting bodies. I've, I've literally grown massive mushrooms in complete darkness so you don't need light there's a big old debate on whether or not you need light and i don't think you do need light you need very very low light and that's why mushrooms are going to change the world because they're so beneficial to healing and everything they can do and they they cost i mean just fractions of what cannabis cost and various other medicinal remedies cost to cultivate or grow so um from here from here we basically just have to monitor our environments make sure you don't get any cross-contamination pathogens whatever you spray whenever you, your mycelium starts becoming fluffy on the top and really starts becoming harder and compacted and compacting and becoming a cake as they call it um you don't want to spray it too much generally i just spray the lid very lightly and like i said i keep the humidity to the outside and if the the substrate looks like it needs some moisture i'll very lightly spray it but I make sure there's no pooling water. You do not want pooling water whatsoever because pooling water on mycelium can, can cause all sorts of different fungus to grow. And the moment you see a discoloration of yellow, green, blue, you're essentially that bin's done. You, I, I don't even chance it. I don't, and, and I don't mean blue, like in a blue meanie or like a dark, dark purple, brown color, like a mazatapic or something like they're where they're supposed to. I mean like a very off-site color on the mycelium patch itself that is growing and slimy and it smells off. It's not good. So don't get me wrong. Psilocybin smells like fungus, but there's a certain 
fun like if it smells like rotting or bad or like gross that's usually a bad smell and not good so um you have to be very very cognizant now whenever you start growing your strains certain strains do have blue stems and get blue spotted stems or various colored stems like i was talking about don't be wary just make sure you look up you either send pictures to like a reddit forum or like someone like myself if you hop on the cannabis chronicles discord which my link's always in the bio you can check it out on my youtube channel you can go on the cannabis chronicles.net and find it from there so literally you hop on ask me questions if you want um i'll be happy to answer them you can dm me you know if you hop on my server and just add me as a friend i'll happily usually accept it i i don't ever not accept friend requests so i don't mind and uh we'll go about uh talking some mushroom stuff but um, I also do private consultations, so that's all. That's a service I always offer, um, you know, on my website. So you guys can check that out. But essentially, from here, it's just growing the mushrooms. Once they fruit, and you see them fruit, and you see the veils start to tear, you'll just have to use your trim shears and go in there and cut them at the base of the stalk as far down as you can get. And uh, don't worry if there's a little bit of uh, soil on your stuff; you can wipe it off. A little cocoa never hurt anyone. Get as much of the stock as you can. The stock actually has a lot of a, a lot of the psilocybin um, is in the stock. It's just the psilocybin inside the cap is generally more of a euphoric experience. So the cap for the 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 stocks are going to be more of like a body sensation to the caps being more of like a mind or euphoric or visual. So it's really interesting how that works with mushrooms. Some caps are really hard to see on whether or not the veils are breaking like albino penis envy. So I suggest looking up what it looks like to harvest, like what's the proper harvest. There's tons of videos out there. And the reason I'm doing, I'm actually going to be growing multiple strains and showcasing all these how to grow individual, like how to grow UFOs in cocoa, how to grow penis envies in cocoa, how to do this. I'm going to show where I pull my, my mushrooms, what my yield is, what the experience is, what they... I'm going to do a trip report always at the end. So that's going to be a big one. And it is going to be an honest trip report where I've done it at least two to five times to give an average experience and not just myself, but my fiance as well. So um, these are the things that, um, you know, and I'm using to heal anxiety, depression, and a lot of other shit that I'm dealing with. And pain wise, I'll tell you what, mushrooms do the most for my pain. So as far as that goes, I've had great, great, great things for, uh, with my pain and just mentally all that fun stuff. So yeah, it's just a matter of harvesting them and then taking them into your dehydrator. If you have a dehydrator, making sure your dehydrator is clean. You want to wipe the living crap out of it. And it's only a mushroom dehydrator. Okay. Just specifically for mushrooms. Or you do what I told you with the trays, or you have some sort of drying area or racks or hangers of some sort. Everything needs to be clean, 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 clean though. Cause you can still get like you can still cause an infection within the fungus while it's drying. You don't want to cause that. So usually it takes about, I'd say about in a dehydrator. I don't know, man. I don't have one. So I wouldn't be able to tell you guys how long it takes to dry. Maybe like 16 hours or something like that or six hours. I, I don't really know how long a, a dehydrator takes. Um, for me, it takes like three or four days. I dry the crap out of my mushrooms, man. Like, like not to like where they're like bad or like gross or anything, but like there, I make sure there's no humidity in them. And I usually, how I store them is a continuous dry aging process in like a sterilized environment. So I actually buy an extra lid that is one of the inoculation lids with the self healing pore and the little filter. And that's my mason jar lid. Uh, it allows air exchange, believe it or not, because mushrooms do produce CO2. And so it will allow gases to escape from the jar and enter the jar. So there is slight air exchange that happens, but I actually do it like that because I find that they continue to dry in a proper like curing almost like manner to where I don't have any issues with like with what can happen with cannabis, where if you have a uh, wet bud, you can get botrytis in your your jar. Well, the same thing with fungus if you have wet fungus that isn't dried properly it can make a whole jar go bad by getting mold um that you don't want <laughs> the bad fungus so that's essentially the stages of cultivating popcorn tech start to finish uh you know i didn't think i'd actually get a mycology 101 popcorn tech all in an hour but we did it and i'm very surprised they're really there literally is nothing else to this. I will be making YouTube videos on all of this. Uh, 
I like I said, I have a guide on my blog that it's literally like I wrote it like Tim Burton. Like it's it's a fun it's fun to read. It gives you a little bit of wit, like it's a little more interesting and more entertaining, but it's it's straight to the point. It tells you exactly what you need. I have all the supplies there. I've linked every everything online. I've linked it to exactly the item that you would want to purchase. So you can find everything you need. You don't need every type of bin. You just need the bin that suits you. Um, and if you're only growing like one mushroom, like one bin, you don't need like a ton. <laughs> so, um, and I'm going to even shout out Boomer Shroomer. She has like inflatable monotubs that she sells with little filters and stuff like that. So you guys can go check those out. I have a friend who actually bought one and he's had a very pleasant experience with it. Um, so you know what? I, that, that's an option too. So that's literally all you need. Go check out my blog, read through it. There's a lot more in depth stuff because i mean i can write a lot more in depth and it's a little more easier there's pictures that i've all of the pictures on the blog are my pictures i've i took all of those myself i uh, everything i call i literally did and i made sure that this blog was awesome and amazing i also have another blog i wrote over on fungus head so if you go to fungus head and you get spore syringes from them uh and you read their blog uh then you'll actually see the article that i wrote for them as well so um, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing that is, I, you know, it's like almost the same article as mine, but I just wrote mine in a little goofier, fun way, like a Tim Burton manner. So I had fun with it anyways. Um, yeah, you can check that out. You can check out all of that fun stuff. This has been a really fun episode. Like I said, I I'm working on the, uh, I'm working on doing the, uh, psilocybin video. Like I said, the start to finish, cause I don't want to do like multiple videos. I want to do how to grow like I want to do like a mycology 101 popcorn tech UFO and then like I'll have a popcorn tech uh, mazatapic or popcorn tech blue mini or popcorn tech blah 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 so I can you guys and gals out there can see literally every strain grown start to finish and the parameters I use how I did it and you can copy me and you know when to pick the veils I'll get nice close-up videos and everything Everything that I wish people would have on video <laughs> that isn't generally on video, but now we can do it because we live in a state that um, isn't coming after us. So that's cool. So without further ado, um, I hope you guys and gals enjoyed this episode. I know it wasn't cannabis cultivation, but a lot of people enjoy the mycology lately. And if you are open to small doses, it's not a psychoactive like you think. It's actually... You know, if you really enjoy the benefits of cannabis, I think every cannabis cultivator could enjoy the benefits of fungus as well, of all sorts, um, specifically psilocybin. But yeah, smash that like button, comment down below if you have any questions, and subscribe or follow along if you've really enjoyed this. You know, it shows uh, Visionary Hydroponics and TMB some love, and they're the reason I get to do this every week. So be sure to show them some serious love. I'm your host, Chronic, from the Cannabis Chronicles on all major streaming platforms and YouTube, and I'll be back every single Wednesday to teach you all about mushrooms, cannabis, and whatever else like mead. So um, without further ado, much love, happy mushroom growing, and peace, everyone.